This is a story about two very different documents. The Teeks, written by the duly elected members of the Texas State Board of Education, versus the APUSH framework, written by a committee of nine people, selected by the College Board, a private organization that is accountable to no one. The vision and purposes of the two documents are very different. Teeks celebrates our nation's founders, the benefits of the free enterprise system, and the values embodied in the concept of American exceptionalism. The APUSH framework ignores most of the founders, fails to discuss free enterprise, and totally omits American exceptionalism. Early this morning, I drove across the Delaware River at the same place where General Washington led the Continental Army on Christmas Eve, 1776. I have not come to Austin today as a Democrat or a Republican. I have not come here as a liberal or a conservative. I have come here as a proud American. My message is clear and timeless. Principles are enduring. From William Travis at the Alamo, to Roy Benavidez in Vietnam, to Marcus Luttrell in Afghanistan, Texans have always defended American values. Now it is your turn. I urge this committee to say yes to Mr. Mercer's resolution and no to the College Board's attempt to nationalize American history and circumvent both the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and your own Texas Teaks. Ladies and gentlemen, if Texans lead, others will follow. Thank you. First of all, thank you for coming all this way. You're, welcome. Uh, you're inspiring, and I, I love your article. I have it on my blog, and where you 29 bias statements in the AP U.S. History Redesign. It's very thorough and, and well done and helped me understand the issue very Thank much. You. Uh, could you expand a little bit about, because I know that Common Core has uh, recognized you as a, one of the leaders in the APUS history, uh, and you've written several books. So could you kind of expand a little bit on that and where, yes. where you are, they are with you? Thank you very much. I, I really would like to address this topic. Uh, there have been some um, insinuations that the reason why I've spoken out against the APUSH framework is because it's somehow a threat to books I've written. Here's the book right here. The book is entitled AP US History Crash Course. It's a very good book. I'm very proud of this book. This is the second edition. It's the flagship book in REA's sequence of books on many subjects. I'm the designer of the uh, framework that we use for these books. And I can tell you there was great excitement in the company when the new framework came out. The excitement had nothing to do with whether people liked it or didn't like it. It's because in the textbook, and especially in the prep industry, when there's a new framework, a new course, that's good because it means the second edition is out and the third edition is in. Uh, so profits come rolling in. I even mentioned to one of the uh, editors, I said, what do you think of that uh, framework? And he said, who cares? You know, pragmatically, we're going to have a new book and we're going to have a contract for you to sign because we want you to be the, of course, to continue being the author. This is the most successful book REA publishes. Uh, and I said, well, I need a little time. The more I looked at the framework, the less I liked it. When I looked at New England, I found one sentence. There was no John Winthrop's City Upon a Hill sermon. Roger Williams is not there. The cause of religious freedom is not there. And when I looked at Virginia, the House of Burgesses is not there. The cradle of democracy. I kept flipping through, and as I say, the more I saw, the less I liked. After the French and Indian War, there's a full page discussing white-Indian relations. 
More time, it turns out, is directed to white Indian conflict after the French and Indian War than to World War II and World War I combined. And then I looked at the Monroe Doctrine. Now, the Monroe Doctrine has been on virtually every A push exam. Uh, and what I found was the U.S. sought dominance over North America. I taught my kids for a long time that the Monroe Doctrine had to do with the United States becoming the protector of democratic institutions in the Western Hemisphere. And then I looked at Manifest Destiny. Now, I'm willing to bet that every one of us in this room was taught that Manifest Destiny is America's mission to spread democracy across this continent. It's not that defined that way in the framework. It asserted U.S. power in the Western Hemisphere. It was built on a belief in white racial supremacy, which is, this is a quote, which is one of the main themes in this document. And then how about big business? Rightly so. Your teams require a free enterprise system to be discussed, and this is one of the great free enterprise states in America. The Hispanic population in this state leads the country in founding new businesses. Well, they don't use the term free enterprise in the framework. Big business. Big business interests sometimes, and naturally they, quote, exploited natural resources, and naturally battled with labor and conservationists. Like I said, the more I read, the less I liked it. And then when we got to World War I, the American Expeditionary Force played a relatively limited role. That's the sentence. More space is devoted to white Indian relations after the French and Indian War. Tell that to the two million doughboys who went to Europe and the 100,000 plus who died. America actually stepped up and saved Western Europe. They know it, we know it, but the framework authors choose not to say so. And of course, World War II has been much discussed. According to the framework, the three sentences on World War II, uh, the atomic bomb should feature a discussion of American values. That bomb is probably the reason why I'm here. My father was a decorated World War II pilot, B-24. He was in every combat mission from Midway to the firebombing of Japan. And Dad said he didn't know if he was going to make it if we had to invade Japan. He felt, he always felt, that the atomic bomb saved Japanese and American lives. And I'm actually named after Harry S. Truman. I'm Larry S. Krieger because my father was so grateful for our president dropping the bomb, saving, he felt, many lives. And so, here are some examples of what I saw when I looked through it. There are more, as you just said, I wrote a list once, I published a list of 29. 29, this is just five or six. And so what to do? I get email, when are you gonna sign the contract? Get the new edition out. You're our top-selling author. And I had to give thought to this. And I had to think about my high school teachers who taught me that America has a mission for good in this country. The framework's not about America and its mission for good. Everyone knows America's had faults and failings. That's not up for debate. But America does stand for values. And America has had a mission for good in this country. And then how about my students? For years and years, I've taught students. And we've talked about people of courage and conviction. We looked at William Lloyd Garrison, who said no to slavery. To Rosa Parks, who said no to segregation. How could I go ahead and write a book when I didn't believe in it after spending almost four years teaching students about courage and conviction. And then there was the matter of my father and his buddies, the bomber barons. How could I let them down? This is the group, by the way, that bombed the Japanese aircraft carriers at Midway. I'm very proud of that fact. Mr. Krieger, you might have more questions. Yeah, but I think I, the bottom line, done. you I'm said you done. didn't sign And okay. so the bottom line is, with all that, I did not sign the book the contract. There is no conflict of interest. 
I stand, as I said before, on principles. Thank you for coming down.